Memory and Error Think of your earliest memory. Is it of you running around at the playground, going to an amusement park, or meeting your sibling? Can you picture what was happening? Chances are, this memory was actually completely invented by your brain. We don't have a video recorder attached to our eyes. Our brain is responsible for constructing our memories, and therefore our memories are not necessarily a reflection of reality. Instead, they're influenced by our pre-existing beliefs and biases, which shape them into the reality that our brains accept. Before we start diving into critical thinking, we have to explore the nature of memory in detail so we can understand how our brains construct what we remember and know. The part of our memory that we use the most in everyday life is our short-term memory. This is information that we've recently processed and that we can remember without much conscious effort. This act of remembering is temporary. We often forget what is stored in the short-term memory in the long term. Research shows that we can only remember about seven things using short-term memory, and we can only access it up to a minute after we've processed the information. This might seem like barely using your memory, but it's actually very important. For example, when someone talks to you, you need to remember the previous words they've said to understand their statement. Short-term memory is also responsible for why we forget where we've put things. If our brains are thinking about too many other things, the location of the lost item gets bumped out of short-term memory. Our short-term memory evolved to be so small because it helps us focus on important things, like whether a lion is about to eat us, instead of being distracted by the stick we recently stepped on. Short-term memory, like bias and emotions, is designed to help us survive in the wild. Since short-term memory occupies such a small space in our brains, we also don't hold complete memories there the way we keep long-term memories. Instead, our brains use signifiers like words and images that it can extrapolate from. Since this form of memory is so limited and fleeting, we have to make an effort to retain any information we want to remember in the long term. This effort can be in the form of repeating information or breaking it down into smaller, simpler parts. You can also undertake a process of association like a mind palace. Mind palaces are a mnemonic device where you have a mental picture of a house and you put things you want to remember in different rooms, so you build associations with certain images and other memories. Your motivation to remember something can also help you remember it. If you're on an amazing vacation and you say to yourself, I want to remember this, you probably will. Once you've completed this process of concentration, the piece of information you focused on will move to your long-term memory, which you keep over a longer period of time than you might think. Although you might think you don't remember much from childhood, you definitely remember your high school graduation clearly, even if it's been 30 years. In fact, there's a lot of debate over whether you actually forget memories or if it just becomes more difficult over time to find them in your brain. Long-term memory primarily associates memories with meaning and other memories, which is why mnemonic devices work. However, there's also evidence that our brain associates them with sound, which is probably why it's easier to remember song lyrics than book passages or poems. How does this process of putting things in our long-term memory work in terms of the brain's physical structure? To process information for long-term memory, the brain actually rewires the structure of its neurons or nerve cells. This is called long-term potentiation. Whenever we learn anything, it changes the way our brain cells are organized and can even create new brain cells. The structures formed by our neurons are called neural networks because neurons communicate with each other through them. When we develop new networks through learning, our neurons create proteins that help transfer neurotransmitters or chemical signals that help brain cells communicate through connections between the cells called synapses. Each time we use this connection, it grows stronger. These connections also bridge other parts of the brain, like the visual and auditory cortices, which helps us tie sensory data to our memories. Short-term memory's physiology is temporary 
It's mostly quick, temporary communications between the sensory part of our brain and the frontal, prefrontal, and parietal lobes, which mainly control fast decision-making. However, long-term memory is reflected in much more permanent, well-developed connections in our brains, which also end up covering a larger surface area. You might know the hippocampus as the part of our brain associated with memory, but it's not where long-term memories are stored. Instead, it helps transfer data from the short-term memory to the long-term, as well as jump-starting the structural changes we've talked about. So how does forgetting work? When we forget something, it means that the connections we formed in our neural networks have gotten weaker. Forgetting can also occur when our brains build a new network over the old one. Think of how back in the day, you could tape over a video on VHS to store a different video. This latter way of forgetting is the same sort of process. This is why we often become forgetful when we feel burned out or overloaded with work. Our brains often tape over what was there before to store something new. Have you ever wondered how much you have the potential to remember? In 2007, Richard Wiseman conducted an experiment called Total Recall to test exactly that, how much humans have the ability to remember. He did this by showing two volunteers, both female, 10,000 images in two days, then testing them to see how many of the images they could remember. This type of experiment was not new. Lionel Standing first conducted this memory test in the early 1970s in Canada, where he found that his subjects could remember 70% of the images, or 7,000 of the things they'd seen for only seconds at a time over just a couple of days. The problem with this study was that it was hard to replicate. Wiseman was the first to try. Wiseman found that the subjects were, on average, better able to remember images if there were fewer of them, but he still found an amazing remembrance rate. On average, 98% for 612 images and 65% for 10,000 images. Neither test subject expected to remember so much. It turns out we remember much more of what we see in our daily lives than we think, whether they're advertisements, faces, or traffic patterns. People actually have a very powerful visual memory. However, our memories are not like the easily accessible hard drive of a computer. They still have limits. The most obvious limit you might think of is when you can no longer remember something. This is often the only memory flaw we can readily detect, but it is not the only one. Our memories can also merge over time into a single memory, or they can change. This means that our memories are not always reliable, but interestingly enough, strong emotions can make for stronger memories. Flash bulb memories are memories we have of sudden, unexpected things that are tied to strong emotions instead of more everyday events. These tend to last longer than more quotidian memories and preserve more detail of the actual event. For example, most people who were alive during John F. Kennedy's assassination or 9-11 vividly remember where they were, what they were doing, and who they were with when they learned of the event because they felt strong emotions. This type of memory is often tied to emotional traumas, which is why sexual assault survivors also vividly remember attacks even if they happened long ago. Roger Brown and James Kulik coined the term flashbulb memory in 1977 for traumatically charged memories. Their theory was that the brain captures these events so accurately because they are too difficult to process in the moment and must be analyzed later when the person has more distance from the event. This provides the evolutionary advantage of learning from traumatic experiences to prevent them from recurring. However, these memories do seem to degrade a little over time. A 1992 study by Ulrich Nieser and Nicole Harsh assessed the nature of flashbulb memories. They asked 106 students about their memory of the Challenger explosion through a questionnaire. Two and a half years later, they gave the same group the same questionnaire. They then compared these questionnaires to assess how accurate the students' memories were two and a half years after the first survey. They found that a quarter of the students got a score of zero 
on an accuracy scale of 0 to 7, and that 50% scored a 2 or below. This means that these students' memories of the event had degraded over a relatively short period of time. The students did recall the event. They just recalled it incorrectly. Their memories had altered over time. After 9-11, a similar experiment was conducted. This time, participants' memories of mundane events were assessed in addition to their flashbulb memory of the traumatic event. These researchers found that the key difference between flashbulb memory and everyday memory was that patients had much more confidence in their flashbulb memories than in their ordinary memories. This confidence did not mean that the flashbulb memories were accurate. Confidence can make for vivid memories, but it does not necessarily mean they reflect reality. Think of a fact that you're confident you know. Say you know that your Aunt Carol lived in Michigan a few years ago. But can you remember how you learned it? People often have trouble remembering where they learned something they're confident they remember. This is called source amnesia. Source amnesia happens when your explicit memory, or the memory that you use to remember things like your anniversary or the time of an afternoon meeting, malfunctions. This is the counterpart of implicit memory, where we store subconscious things like knowing how to swim. Explicit memory is for things we intentionally memorize and remember, which makes it crucial for remembering our informational sources. Everyone experiences source amnesia, and for the most part, it won't hurt you. It's more important from an evolutionary perspective to remember what we know instead of how we came to learn it. After all, knowing that fire burns is more important than remembering which person guided us away from it as a child. However, nowadays it is important to be able to cite our sources for information. Otherwise, we could end up believing lies or misinformation or even end up spreading it ourselves because we don't know if the source is reliable. Humans also experience truth amnesia, which is the phenomenon where we remember a statement more than whether or not it is true. We tend to say, oh, I've heard that before, without recognizing that we also heard that the statement was untrue. This is how rumors spread. If we're familiar with something, we remember the statement itself more than we remember its truthfulness, but the fact that we remember it makes us think it's true. Thus, we can be convinced into assigning incorrect truthfulness to information we're actually merely acquainted with. This is known as the illusory truth effect and was discovered in 1977 in a joint study undertaken by a team of researchers from Temple University and Villanova University. For example, we can think, Oh, I've heard something about Cuba being involved in JFK's assassination, but not remember that this has been debunked. We then have the overall impression that Cuba was involved in the assassination. This is what makes misinformation and alternative facts so insidious. If we don't make an effort to remember they're not true, our brains trick us into thinking they are. The power of suggestion is very powerful. Repetition and reinforcement can convince us something is true. Hindsight bias is another form of this effect. If someone tells us something is true, we retroactively connect the dots to make ourselves believe we could have made that conclusion. Familiarity can be stronger than rational thought, so we have to watch out for it in critical thinking errors. The final aspect of our memories that is important to understand in the context of critical thinking is that we have two different types, emotional memory and detail memory. Emotional memory is our general impression of what happened and is, as you might have guessed, mostly tied to our emotions. For example, you can probably remember a time you were scared just from this suggestion of it. You probably have places or situations you associate with emotions like fear, even though you might not remember what the original event that makes you feel this way was. Meanwhile, your detail memory is related to exactly what it sounds like. Details. Functional MRI scans taken when people recall these different types of memories have shown that they have different brain patterns, which means they stimulate different areas' neurological activity. This means that different parts of our brain 
handle details and broader emotions. Details are harder for us to remember because in addition to having a much stronger neurological memory for emotions, our minds like to focus on the most compelling stimuli and tune out the rest. This is known as selective attention. And it's actually a good thing because it prevents our brains from being overloaded with sensory data. Instead, we only remember the important details. For example, if you're attacked with a weapon, you definitely remember what the weapon was, but not necessarily the brand of the attacker's t-shirt. The flip side of our tendency to block out small details is that our brain often fills these in for us in our memory, and it doesn't do this very well. These details are often altered or just plain incorrect. Most of the details you remember from any given situation are therefore actually constructed rather than a direct recollection of what happened. These details can also change based on your broader knowledge base because each time you learn new information, your brain also updates the other things it knows. Our brains like to have a narrative of our experiences in the world so it often changes our memories to fit that narrative. This is why we're so prone to exaggeration. Our minds like to make us think dangers were bigger than they really were. Of course, you can see how this would be helpful from an evolutionary perspective. The details in our memories are biased, constructed, and invented by necessity, but it's important that we recognize this. Researchers call this memory contamination. Think about a conversation you recently had with friends. If you ask your friends about it, their memories of what they said will likely be very different than yours, and the same will be true of your memories of your own words. This is because our brains are always biased toward our own narrative and construct our memories to conform to that narrative. This is why it's important to share perspectives and recognize that people have contaminated memory by nature. We all have something important to contribute when reflecting on the past. If you have a job where memory is important, this is especially important for you to keep in mind. Your memories, although you might have high confidence in them, are not always accurate. If you're a police officer who's interviewing witnesses about an incident, keep in mind that the witness's memory of that incident will be biased toward their own narrative. If you're a therapist, you need to keep in mind that your client's memories are not always accurate and might be influenced by psychological issues or a traumatic history. An important way to counter this is to ask open-ended questions that require more than yes or no answers because they will produce more accurate results than a leading question like, did you see the thief turn left at the intersection? Coincidentally, this is why open questions are typically used in direct examination in court, where the lawyer is questioning their side's witness, and leading questions are used in cross-examination, where the lawyer is trying to poke holes in the other side's witness's testimony. The FBI views leading questions as actually contaminating the interrogation process and discourages its agents from using them. It also discourages the use of coaching, which is the practice of leading a witness to give information that confirms the agent's hypothesis. This will lead to confirmation bias in the interrogation. For example, if the agent asks an interrogation subject about a specific subject's presence at the scene of a crime, they're coaching them toward evidence against that suspect. Open-ended questions allow more room for the witness to give their own account of what they know. Stress is also a big factor in memory, and FBI agents, as well as other law enforcement professionals, are encouraged to keep this in mind. A more relaxed person is more likely to give an accurate statement, rather than one geared towards what they think an interrogator wants to hear. Therefore, the FBI actively encourages compassionate procedures that keep in mind a subject's own narrative, that is, their culture, their biases, and their experiences. As you might have seen in criminal justice shows and podcasts like Making a Murderer and Serial, memory is one of the most useful tools available to law enforcement. But its fickleness means that witnesses need to be treated carefully. Otherwise, the justice system can fail to do its job and bring the right person to justice. 
It's important to recognize that while our memories are a valuable resource, they are rarely a 100% accurate account of reality. Our brains have evolved to, to create, twist, and construct our memories around our pre-existing biases and personal narratives. The physical structures of our brain actually change along with our memories, which means that changes are often permanent until another change happens. We often fill in the gaps in the information we take in with details that are complete constructions, or even taken from a different memory. Think of people's tendency to embellish their memories with details from movies they've seen. We often don't even know that we're doing this. To us, all our memories are true, and it can be difficult to impossible to spot a false memory. This means that critical thinking is an especially important tool when it comes to thinking about the past, that is, the process of creating history. Our memories are not reliable. If you can recognize this, you can work with others to construct an accurate picture of past events. This is what historians do every day, but you can even do this in your own life. Consider that conflicts might have actually been due to something you said or did, even though you don't remember it that way. Unless something is taped, written down, or collected in another objective manner, we can't trust that it is what really happened. Recognizing this is a crucial step to developing critical thinking skills. Memory is one resource, but evidence and logical reasoning are essential to discovering the truth.